we are not, we are not wolf eyes. We are not. Oh, we used to, I don't know. Yeah, what are we not? A part of a system. I mean, you could say that and you will be a part of a system, but again, like it goes back to, you know, you can have the freedom, but a lot of people don't use their self-conscious or something like that. And having your own language, you have to learn to in, in, uh, integrate it into a, a society, you know? But there's that gray area where it can't be integrated, you know? And I think that that's where all the great art lies. We're not academic. We are self-taught. I've never taken a class uh, of music. Uh, I never graduated high school. I dropped out as soon as I could. Um, Olson, kind of the opposite, but that's why we get along. His dad's a uh, uh, ex-military general. My dad's a hippie, so yeah, opposites. I started Wolf Eyes in the fall of 96. My bandmate in Mini Systems was named Tony Miller. And he started a solo project in the middle of our band called Maximum Cloud. And I was a little off put by that. So I was walking home from hanging out with him and I stopped to look through a dumpster, which is something we did quite often, uh, just looking through. We lived in a university town, so when students move out, there's piles, piles of their belongings just sit on the street, so we'd always go through them. And that day, I found a answering machine tape, which is a tape loop, and a Paul Winter Wolf Eyes cassette tape. And I went home and yeah, decided that was my band, Wolf Eyes, and I made a tape. It was the sound of water. The first sound wolf pups made as they came from their den, and uh, the, a one single floor tom. And it was like a uh, 60 minute tape. Then I gave it to Aaron Dillaway just as a gift. Um, like, hey, you know. And in those days, bands weren't bands. You know, we were just kids. Uh, meeting together and having parties. There was no way we were going to get a gig, you know, at all, except for trashing frat houses. And to my surprise, uh, Dillaway loved it and him and my friend Steve Kenny, they would sit around uh, listening to it, reading books. And I was like, that's hilarious. The first time I met Nate was at Delaway's house in Brighton, and when the three of us hung out, it was just, something just clicked. It just, it just felt cosmic, you know? And then Nate was, Nate would sing with UI or play electronics. There was a really, you know, we did a lot of house shows together. We did a really good show on Easter in Lansing with the King Brothers from Japan. And it was like just in a kitchen, and it was just unbelievable experience and we opened up for the boredoms and stuff like that. That's when we started to realize like, oh gosh, we can actually, like people are appreciating what we're doing. Yeah. Like we had no idea. We're pretty isolated, you know, in Michigan. And it was, you know, back in those days in the, in the uh, mid to late nineties, it was really hard to get a record press, but there was a CZ pressing in Czechoslovakia that you could do editions of a hundred, which back then was unheard of. You could only do, I think the minimum was 5,000, you know? So we found that we were able to get editions of 100 really cheap and fast. And that just blew our minds. Like Dillaway's, uh, Dillaway did a bunch, the UI did a bunch. That really accelerated our individualism from that and nobody was doing it and there was not that many people so we could get rid of, rid of them really quick and do the handmade covers because we were all artists. 
visual artists still are, you know. MSU where they had a, where I went to grad or undergrad for art school and they had a outdoor place that just had abandoned art projects and like sheet metal and like stuff so I was playing them I was like oh, I really like the sound of this and and Nate and Aaron were like hey, how about you play we'll get a gig and you just play like the first 10 minutes doing sheet metal and stuff like that and I was just I couldn't sleep I was so excited you know it was great back then there there was a a woman who would write poems while Wolf Eyes would play. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, who doesn't want to be in a fucking band like that? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, I love these guys, and that's just, that's just rock and roll. You So the evolution of our sound definitely came from the thrift store, more or less. <laughs> like it really did, or the garbage, we like to say. Most people are like kind of yawn, like, oh yeah, sure, right. Cool tag tagline, but it's really true. Doing the electronics and the oscillations, 99% of things would die. They would just fry out or wouldn't work. And, and thrift stores was a cheap advantage to find stuff that you can additionally keep killing you would have to kill it or get it to the point where it was gonna die and that would be the amazing sound yeah that's what we wanted i had read a little bit about bb and louise Barron and um their whole cybernetic idea of circuits that would have a short lifespan but were alive like biology on a lower life form level The early stuff I did not write, I discovered. And I've always stuck with that, uh, discovery versus uh, composition. You know, it's a fine line nowadays. Composition comes after, you know, but you have to discover something first and then you can slowly compose it. It's all, life is set up into a kit and if you read the directions, it's gonna be a little easier, but incredibly boring. Like, it's always good to microwave the directions for like 10 seconds. So they just morph a little bit.